Grace and peace to you from God, our Father Almighty, and from His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. I'm Pastor Kyle Timmons from St. Peter's United Church of Christ in Grant Park, Illinois. And today is Sunday, March 25th, 2020. The Bible says that where two or more are gathered, the presence of the Spirit is with us, and God has joined with us. While we physically are unable to join together at this time, we do believe that through the Spirit and through the bond of Christian love, we can join together to encourage one another, to worship our God in heaven, and to continue to, to be thankful for the things that we do have. Today, I invite you to, to join us as we worship through special songs, through prayer, through the reading of God's Word, and through today's message. I also invite you, if you have any prayer concerns or, or even any needs, uh, to send them to me at Pastor Kyle Timmons at live.com. And we will be able to, uh, to read through them, include you in on our prayers, um, or also reach out to be able to, to help you through these tough situations in life. Today, I don't have any um, specific announcements of what will be happening uh, for this upcoming week. I can assure you that we will not be meeting this Wednesday for Lent. Uh, again, we will provide a, an online service of some sort. I also do not believe that we will be meeting next week, uh, March 29th, uh, for worship in person either. But stay tuned, and perhaps things will change as we continue to monitor the situation across the globe. Church council members, um, we will not meet in person th this Tuesday evening, but I will send out a, a, an email of some items that we need to discuss and some ways that we can continue to be doing the work of Christ. So I ask you to, to be checking your emails throughout the week. Again, if anyone has any prayer requests or any concerns, please share them with me. Email them to me or, or even call the church. Area code 815-465-6191. Would you join me as we pray to begin this morning's service? Loving God, we fall on our knees and we worship you. In times such as these, it would be easy to lament and to be discouraged. And while undoubtedly there are many who are discouraged, many who are depressed, many who are filled with anxiety, I pray that you could turn our spirits into something joyous. Teach us that you are still in control. Remind us of your presence and how you can join together with Christians throughout the world through this wonderful technology. Lord, I pray that each one here, as they've tuned in to today's service, would be able to, to shut off the distractions around them, remove the, the sound of televisions and radios, and perhaps even join together as family or as couples and listen to today's service, to be able to to think about you and to praise you through song, to be able to hear and read your word together, and to remind us again of the importance of being your disciples and what it is that we can be doing as followers of Christ in this, in this world now, where maybe we aren't able to make face-to-face -face contact with people, but we can still be disciples. We can still follow you, take up our cross, we can still devote our lives to serving you and to serving our neighbors. Oh God, as we enter your presence, let us do so with clean hearts. Forgive us of all of our sin. Wipe away all of our iniquity. Remind us that we belong to you. Through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, we pray. Amen. And I pray that you enjoy today's service.
A reading from Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cry to you, Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, so that we can, with reverence, serve you. I wait for the Lord. My whole being waits. In his word I put my hope. I wait for the Lord. More than watchmen wait for the morning. More than watchmen wait for the morning. Israel, put your hope in the Lord. For with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel from all of their sins.
that we do miss as a congregation when we are separated from being together in person is this opportunity to bring our gifts of our tithes and our offerings um, to the altar. A place of significance because we believe that, that God has the ability to, uh, to take the simple, the simple gifts that we have and to multiply them to be used uh, in a variety of ways. At this time, I would encourage you, again, if you are able to give financially to the church, if, it's not, if this is not your congregation, I would pray that you would give to your congregation. If you don't have a congregation, I would pray that you would consider finding one and, and being able to support that church or to be able to support a charity or a, something that helps continue to progress the gospel of Jesus Christ. In a few moments, you'll see on your screen a couple of ways that you can help us here at St. Peter's United Church of Christ in Grant Park. You can give electronically uh, on our Tithely website. It's a link um, that I'll provide here on your screen in a moment. It's secure. It's an easy way to make a donation. You can change it. You can set it up to reoccur at any time, or you can give one time, whatever it may be. Additionally, we have um, automatic withdrawal opportunities here at St. Peter's. Um, it's a form that you fill out, and it's between you and our financial secretary in the bank. I don't even know uh, who gives that much or how much you give type of thing, but you can sign up by calling the church office at 815-465-6191, and we'll mail you a form or email it to you, and you can set it up. That would be a great way to help support your church, not only in times such as these, but also when you're traveling or when you miss um, a church because of vacation or other illnesses or things like that. You can also mail your, your gifts to us here at, at St. Peter's United Church of Christ, P.O. Box 220, Grant Park, Illinois, 60940. The other option is, is to drop it off uh, between 9 o'clock and 1 o'clock. Um, Monday through Friday, someone should be here. And you can just drop that off and hopefully don't have to worry about coming in contact with anybody who is ill. But at this time, your support to the ministry is crucial. Already this week, in our first week of kind of being cooped up together, I've received two requests from community members who needed help. Small amounts, but they needed help just getting through a couple of days of food until they got received their next paycheck. I expect a lot of that to take place in the in the days and weeks ahead. So to be able to, to continue the ministry here at St. Peter's, I would encourage you to pray for, prayerfully ask God how much you should give and then respond in giving. Let us pray. We praise you, O God, from whom all blessings flow. We thank you for supplying our daily needs and help us to remember that we only need our daily bread. We don't need to, to hoard and to plan for, for tomorrow, but to rely and trust in you that you will provide tomorrow. We pray for those who are prayerfully considering what amount to give or how to give or if they can give. Would you lay on their heart to give generously and to give with a grateful heart? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Let us join together now in prayer. As our custom is here at St. Peter's, um, after we share some of the concerns um, and joys within our congregation, we'll begin with a few moments of quietness. Wherever you are, you can um, spend some quiet time in prayer, offering your own individual concerns, um, offering your own prayers at confession, praising God the way that you prefer to do. And then I will continue in prayer and we will uh, close with the Lord's Prayer, which I will lead and I invite you to say quietly in your hearts or out loud, wherever you may be as you watch this video. Uh, we continue to pray for Tom Barrera. Um, Tom had uh, knee surgery last week and was home right after that. Uh, we just pray that Tom is continuing to rehab strongly. Continued prayers for Austin Delaney and his family. We pray for Carter Fortin. Uh, Carter is a young man uh, who is uh, being treated and, uh, for cancer, but also doing well as of the last report. But we thank and pray for you, Carter. Prayers for Nancy Sturm as she continues to rehab from the broken bone she had in her arm a few months ago. Prayers for Carla Leonard. Carla, we have heard that you have returned home, um, and we pray for you and thank God for the progress that you are making, uh, but also continue that he will continue to give you strength in the next days and weeks ahead. Prayers for Nancy Lukey and her health. Continued prayers for Steve Radistitz. Um, Steve had a, a procedure a few weeks ago and is home convalescing. Hopefully he's getting strong. Um, Steve, you promised you'd be running the 10 miler with me uh, at Soldier Field in a few weeks, actually in May. Hopefully that's still on. Um, this will be my one opportunity to beat you. Uh, but prayers for you. I hope all is well um, at your household. Continued prayers for Mary Sirks. Um, Mary had a procedure after a fall a couple weeks ago. We also continue to pray for our, our shut-ins, Mabel, Louise, Minnie, Pauline, and Mildred. We pray for those uh, that we know here locally in our communities that are uh, suffering from the coronavirus. We ask that their health would be restored soon, that they'd be able to fight it off uh, easily, but also that the containment would um, uh, be kept well within uh, the areas of, re that, of the restrictions at home. We pray for all those who are struggling with anxiety and stress and depression at this time. We know that this is not an easy situation, but we do trust um, in the presence of our Lord to get us through it, and we know that this too shall pass. At this time, I invite you to quietly begin this um, opportunity of prayer, and then I will continue us in a few moments. Let us pray. Lately, O oh God, as we have been challenged to socially distance ourselves from one another, we may seem more alone than we ever have. It's great to know that your presence is with us, though. We believe that your spirit within us provides us encouragement for times such as these. We also are grateful that we live in a day and age of technology where we can worship together in ways like this, online. We pray that we have the ability to reach out to one another through phone calls and, and Skype and FaceTime. Lord, I pray now for all of our, our Americans, all of our people in our world, that we would rely fully on you in your healing presence. God, I pray for those locally who are dealing with the effects of this virus 
in their lives. Pray for physical healing for those that we know who have come in contact with it. We pray for your protection, not only upon them, but upon their family members and, and those that they have been in touch with. Lord, I pray for our leaders. I pray for the president and his staff, that you would give them wisdom. I pray for the people of this country, that we would unite, and instead of looking for ways of criticism, look for ways to, to help and to be an encouragement. If we have nothing positive to say, then to spend time in prayer for these individuals. It seems like so many of us believe that we are experts and we don't rely on the expert wisdom that comes from above. Help us to realize our place in this world and, and to be followers of you that encourages us to, to love one another. God, I pray for our local leaders, from the governor to the mayors, big and small towns. I pray for our leaders. I pray for Dr. Palin and his decision with the school staff and the school to, to be on shutdown at this time with the rest of the state. I pray that you would give him and others rest in their minds to realize that they're making the right decision, but to also give them guidance in the, in the weeks and months ahead of the many tough decisions that they will have to make. Allow us to be there to support them. I pray for our teachers. I pray that they'd be able to, to help in whatever ways they can via phone calls and the internet. I pray for our students and our young people. They too have never gone through such a time as this and we know if we are struggling, how much more their minds must be. They've lost interaction with their friends. They've lost the normal ways of life with their teachers and schedules. And quite honestly, they are now stuck at home with their parents. That sometimes we know that we can be a little on the, on, a little on the edge with our nerves. Help us all to take a step back and to, to learn that we're all in this together. God, I pray for those that I've mentioned. I pray for Tom, Austin, Carter, Nancy Sturm, and Nancy Lukey, for Carla, Stephen, and Mary. And I pray for our shut-ins. I pray that you would give them strength, that you would give them a peace in their lives and, and about, allow them to, to feel like they have the energy to, to go throughout the day with whatever tasks that they desire. Lord, I also lift up a silent individual. You know this individual's need in our congregation and in his health concerns as well and ask that you would give him strength. God, I thank you for your love. I thank you that we can sense it whether we're together in this place or if we are scattered abroad. And God, I thank you for your son, Jesus Christ who brought that gift of love to all, that those who would believe on his name would not perish but have everlasting life. And it's your son, Jesus Christ, who taught his disciples to pray these words, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Matthew 16, 24 through 28. Then Jesus told his disciples, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. 
For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? For the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay everyone for what he has done. Truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. A pastor named David Dykes, during a sermon in 2011, uh, shared a humorous story about a dairy farmer who went to buy a new pickup truck. He had seen an old ad in the paper about uh, the many discounts and rebates that the factory had to offer. So he decided he would take his old uh, clunker in and trade it in and pick up something new. He chose a new model and was he ready to write a check for the full amount. And the salesman said, wait, I haven't even given you the final cost quite yet. The farmer said, well, isn't it the price that I saw in the newspaper, in the ad? The salesman said, no, that's the price for the basic model. Um, but with all the other options included, there are extra costs. So after the options were added, the farmer reluctantly wrote a check and he drove off in his new pickup truck. A few months later, the car salesman called the farmer because he wanted to, to buy a cow for his son's 4-H project. The farmer assured the car salesman that he had several good milk cows available um, and they were for sale at the cost of $500 a piece. The salesman drove out to the farm the next day and he picked out the cow that he wanted and he took out his checkbook. But before he wrote the check, the farmer looked at him and he said, but wait, I haven't given you the final cost yet. Then he handed the salesman the following bill, which read, basic cow, $500, two-tone exterior, $45, extra stomach, $75, milk storage component, $60, Straw recycle compartment, $120. Four handy spigots at $10 each, total $40. A leather upholstery, $125. Dual horns, $45. An automatic rear fly swatter, $38. And natural fertilizer attachment, $185. Your grand total will be $1,200. $33. Well, whether you're buying a car or cows, it's important to you that you would know what the bottom line is going to be. Today, I'd like to talk to you about what it means to be a disciple of Christ, a disciple of Jesus, a follower of um, the Son of God himself. And I think that many of us probably already claim to be disciples of Christ, followers of him. And we say it and we kind of say it in jest. We just assume, hey, I'm a follower of Christ because I go to church or because I grew up within the Christian church that I am one of his disciples. But unfortunately, at the same time, I think that perhaps like his earliest disciples, we don't really know what the cost is. We don't understand. We don't really understand and comprehend what the bottom line is when we say we want to be a follower of Christ. I encourage you if, you, if you have your Bibles at home, would you open them? Perhaps take a notebook and a pen or a pencil and, and follow along in these verses from Matthew chapter 16, uh, verses 24 through 28, perhaps, or more so just the first couple of verses in this passage, but jot some down some ideas. And as I try to encourage you uh, weekly, don't just jot down notes, um, just to know things necessarily, but write yourself questions. Ask yourself, how do these verses apply to me? What is the Holy Spirit speaking to me in your place of this world today? And as you follow along, I pray that the Holy Spirit would, would convict you, that the Holy Spirit would explain to you what it really means to be Jesus' follower, and that you too would, would walk away from today's message, um, understanding that it takes more than just a claim of saying, I follow Jesus, than the words that come out of our mouths. It takes a change in lifestyle. Can we pray as we begin this morning's message? Jesus, you called your first disciples away from the things in life that they were comfortable with. 
their occupations, their families, their homes, their friends, and you called them to something greater. I'm sure that they did not know where their adventure would take them, but they went in faith. They went trusting you to learn from you, to watch you and observe the way you interact with people, to see you to the cross and to realize that following you meant more than just wherever their feet would go. But it meant a change in heart. It meant a change in their minds. Lord, be with us this morning as we look at this passage from Matthew and we ask ourselves, are we true disciples? As we ask ourselves, what does it mean to be a disciple? And then to ask ourselves, now what should I be doing as a disciple? We ask this in your name. Amen. As we begin our study of the word this morning, I want to do something different than what we would do on a Sunday morning because I believe we have a few extra moments um, this way than what we would on a Sunday morning. And I want to look at this text uh, at a more deeper level. I want to look at this text word for word or phrase by phrase, and I wanted to understand where we are in, in the context of Matthew's gospel. And as we begin, the verse 24 says, Then Jesus said to his disciples. The word then means that something prior to this verse took place that would tie into what we're about to study. So if you look back a verse, verse 23, it says, Jesus turned and he said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God but merely human concerns. I don't know about you, but Peter must have been taken back. And I'm sure the other disciples that were with him were probably going, whoa, Jesus, how dare you call him Satan? I mean, I don't know what could be worse as a Christian than to be identified as the evil one, the evil one amongst your midst. I remember when um, years ago, Around the time I was in, in the Navy, I was finding myself struggling with this sin of lying. I was good at it. I lied to cover up things or to cover up hurt for, by other people. And I would say things and I would try to, I would try to manipulate um, my own beliefs in something based on lies. And it wasn't until I read a passage that said, when we lie, we speak the devil's language. That hit me hard. I realized that when I was lying, I was the devil himself. The devil masked around his holy, his only um, desire is to lie to you. He tries to tell you you're not good enough. He tries to tell you that what you're doing is wrong. He tries to lie. That was his nature from the very beginning in the Garden of Eden. That got my attention to think that I was speaking the same language as the devil. And here, Jesus looks at Peter and he says, get behind me, Satan. Your mind is not on the things above. He's saying, you are so self-centered. You are looking at what you can do for yourself. Your life is centered around you and what you can do and not on the things of God. And that was a stumbling block to Jesus' ministry. Let me ask you, where are your concerns today? Where is your mind focused? Is it focused on the things of God and his eternity? Or is it on the things of humanity? Oh, it's hard to live in these days. It's hard not to be focused on, on our 401ks. It's hard not to focus on where we're going to go tomorrow. It's hard to focus if, if we're going to catch the COVID-19 it's hard to focus when all of these things around us are telling us, think about us first. God says that when our minds are more concerned about the earthly, we are a stumbling block 
to his ministry. How can we make the concerns of humanity? How can we make the concerns of our world the concerns of God? Is it our responsibility to do that? Or is our responsibility to be aware of what's going on around us, but at the same time to stay focused, to stay grounded on the eternal mind and plan of God? Then, so after Jesus got done rebuking Peter, it says, then Jesus turned to his disciples, the rest of the group. Who are, who were Jesus' disciples? Well, a disciple, uh, it can be defined as those people who are dedicated followers of someone. Now, remember back then, and even in today, a disciple can be a follower of anyone. There were disciples of John the Baptist. There were disciples of the Pharisees. And in today's world, we have the same thing. We have disciples of the Pope. We have disciples of, of this Christian leader, this theologian, this famous seminarian. We have people that we have replaced that we would rather follow them and their ideologies than following God himself. But Jesus said to his disciples, the group of people belonging to Jesus, those who were following, these were people who were devoted to following his doctrines and his teachings. They were people, the men who relied on his sacrifice. They were those who possessed his spirit and those who imitated his example. Jesus said to this group, to those who are his disciples, and therefore if we claim, if we desire to be his disciple, he's saying to us this, whoever wants to be my disciple, whoever wants to be my disciple, catch that, that word right there that says wants. I'm wondering throughout the course of Christianity, how many people thought that they had to be a disciple I wonder how many of you think that, well, because my parents grew up in the church, I have to be a follower of Jesus Christ, or whatever it may be. Jesus' idea of those who follow him isn't a mandate of saying, you must follow me, so to speak. He says, whoever wants to be. Discipleship is a choice. It's not mandatory, but it's a choice. And I'm going to tell you, it's the right choice to make, but it is a choice. And because of that, Jesus says, whoever wants to be my disciple must do this. He says there must be a threefold response. He says the first thing that we must do is that we must deny ourselves. He says whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves. A few things here. First of all, this word must. If you want to be a disciple, you must do something. It's mandatory. It's not something we can negotiate. You can't decide, hey, Jesus, I'm going to be a disciple, but it's got to be on my terms. It's got to be the way that I want to do it. To be a follower of Jesus means you have to do it based on his rules, on his way, not our own. It says you must deny. Think about what it might mean to deny. Several definitions that I came across in the biblical study of this word deny means to lie. Like to say, hey, I don't really know him. Remember what Peter said when they said, don't you know this man, Jesus, when he was in the courtyard? What did he do? He denied knowing Christ. He lied. Another definition would be to disown. Peter certainly did that, didn't he? He, he disowned Christ at that time. To withhold or to keep back to turn back. These are some definitions of what it means to deny. We must deny. But what should we disown? What should we keep back? Ourselves. We must deny ourselves. That means we must, to, to, we must deny our own desires, our own wills, our own plans, our own pleasures. We must be willing to say, hey God, the things of this earth make me happy, they bring me temporary joy, but I'm willing to sacrifice all that. I'm willing to, to, to deny. I'm, I'm ready to say, hey, they don't really make me happy, even though they do. I'm willing to just put it back, to put it aside, deny those things, and continue on following you. But not only must we deny ourselves to be a disciple of Christ, 
we must also take up our cross. This word take kind of jumped into my, in my mind this week when I was thinking about uh, the action of taking within our Christian faith. What happens when we take the bread of Christ? We take the cup of communion, the cup of forgiveness. It's an action. It's something that we're receiving. Some of us think, wow, that is a blessing. We call it the cup of blessing. It's a blessing to take communion. But I wonder, is it, is it a blessing to us to take up our cross? It's also, this word take also means it's a choice. You don't have to take up your cross. But if you don't take it, then you're not a disciple of his. No one is forcing anything. No one is forcing you to do a single thing. But it is there for the taking. It's part of the thought process of our mind. When our thoughts aren't pleasing to God, then we, then we, um, we live separated from him. We need to choose to put those thoughts to death, to put them aside. And then there's this word, the cross. We must take up our cross. And I'm wondering here too, how many of us get confused with this? We think of actually picking up a piece of wood and carrying it. Or we think that we have to, we have to do, take, do something that isn't already given to us to take up our cross. This cross, as many of us have ra were raised to believe, isn't necessarily um, a cross of bearing a sickness or having to endure a bad relationship or having a bad or a terrible, cruel boss in our lives. It's not something that's forced upon you. It's an actual, it isn't an actual problem like we seem to believe. A cross is also a choice, something that you can take up, something that you can choose, and you can get rid of another choice by sacrificing it on your, on your own. Our desires, our pleasures, these are choices that we have to make. Our will, what we think we should be doing with our lives. Jesus said that we need to sacrifice those things. We need to take up our cross, choose to put them aside, and follow him. Paul wrote in Colossians chapter 3, verse 5, that we are to put to death what is earthly inside of us. And he talked about some of these things specifically. He said that we need to put aside and put to death sexual immorality, impurity, passions that are not of his, evil desires, covetousness, any forms of idolatry. We need to put these things aside. We need to choose that these things are not important to us anymore. And we need to sacrifice giving them up to follow him. It means an act of self-denial. Torture, pain is kind of the, the, the mentality behind it. And some of sometimes we joke and we say, okay, I'm going to give up chocolate or I'm going to give up pizza during Lent or I'm going to give up something like this during a time in my life. I'm going to give up social media. And we think, oh, that is such a burden to bear. And for some of us, those things are a burden to bear. But what, what really matters here and what Jesus is saying is something deeper than chocolate. It's saying to give up our old self, to give up the, the way that we used to live, where we would indulge in, in getting drunk and partying, where some may indulge in, in drugs and substance abuse. Some may indulge in um, sexual deviancy. Are those things that important to you that you would, you would say, Jesus, I don't want to really be a follower of yours. I would rather do this instead. Or are you willing to, to hurt yourself a little bit and to say, I don't need those things anymore. The cross also was a symbol of death. A symbol of death. And when we think of the cross, we think of the symbol of Jesus' death. But when I think of my own individual cross to, to bear, or your own individual cross to bear, I think of it, whatever desire, whatever sin is in your life, that you're going to give up, you're going to sacrifice. Not being just a period of time, but, be, for, but being eternal. I can give up. Lying for a day, I hope. 
I can give up lying for a week or maybe during Lent or maybe drinking um, and getting drunk or substance abuse for a period of time. But this idea of a cross means that we're putting it to death. It doesn't come back. It will not come back if you truly put it to death. Our old natures as Christians should have been, hopefully we're put to death. We no longer live with the desires to please ourselves, but to please God. And Jesus says that we need to, um, to be a disciple of his, that we need to deny ourselves. We need to take up our cross and then follow me. Follow Jesus. This word follow, again, I think it references a choice that we have to make. See, some of us are, are willing to, to sacrifice and give up something. We may be able to put it to death. We may be able to take up our cross, so to speak. We might be willing to deny ourselves and say, hey, I don't need this anymore. But then the next step is to follow him. You say, whoa, 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 Jesus, I gave up this stuff, but why do I have to follow you now? I'm not ready to go. This is, like I said, it, it, it's a threefold type of, of a response. Where to be a true disciple of his, we have to be doing all three of these things. We need to deny ourselves. We need to take up our cross and we need to follow him. Follow me, Jesus said. Notice me. He doesn't say follow John the Baptist. He doesn't say follow the Pope. He doesn't say follow this pastor or that preacher or that theologian, or that musician. He doesn't say to follow anyone. He doesn't say to follow Allah or Buddha. He says, follow me. Because he knows that he was the great I am, the only salvation. If we want to be a disciple of Jesus, we must look at Jesus himself and follow him. So that's verse 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. And now we look at verse 25. It begins with the word for. For what? Well, for is just a continuation of what we just read in verse 24. For whoever wants to save their life. Whoever wants to save their life. This again stands out to me as being an individual's choice. Whoever wants. Again, do you want to save your life? That's the question he's asking his disciples in essence. He's saying, are you going to follow me and want to save your life by keeping the things of the past? Or are you going to follow me and, and not worrying about saving your life? Whoever wants to save your life, an individual choice. To save, to preserve it, to keep it unto yourselves. I know many followers, and I'll be honest with you, I, I believe that I'm guilty of this as well, who we say, I'm going to give up something. I'm not going to have this be my passion in life. This isn't going to be where my mind is set on an earthly thing. It's going to be set on God. We deny ourselves and we say, eh, yeah, that's not our priority. But do you know what we do? Do you know what we often do? We put that item in our backpack or in our suitcase and we store it away for a rainy day. Or what if this following Jesus thing doesn't really work out? I can go back and get it, right? Are you saving these things? Or did you really put it to death? Like Jesus told us, that we have to, to take up our cross. We need to, to symbolize it by putting it to death. Whoever wants to save their life, this life that Jesus is talking about, is this life, this life that we live, this air that we are breathing now, this momentary um, period of time throughout eternity, the life in which you breathe, whether it be two years of life or 92 years of life. This is the life he's talking about. It's physical. He says, whoever wants to save their life will lose it. Will means that it's definitive. It's absolutely going to happen. If you want to save your life, if you're keeping it for a rainy day, if you think you can go back to it, he's saying, you're going to lose it. It's a guarantee. Each of us are going to die. 
at some point we all are going to face physical death. And if you're carrying something with you, all of your physical life, I'm going to tell you something. You can't take it with you. I had a, a cousin, we used to always enjoy this one slogan, it used to be on a t-shirt, that he who dies with the most toys still dies. You know, we're taught in our culture that he who has the most toys, the most money, the most power, the most whatever it may be, that they win. But do they win? Maybe here on earth they win, but they're not going to win eternity because those things are keeping them from truly loving and devoting themselves to Christ. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it. It doesn't belong to us anyways. When we lose something, it usually means that we aren't able to find it. We will actually waste our own time. If you think about it, when you, the last thing you, you've lost, haven't you wasted time in your life going back to try to find it? It's an effort searching for something that first doesn't even belong to us. You know, Many people are, are searching for their own physical life. You know what? Our lives really belong to God. So why not lose it and just surrender to him? And even so, even if we could find it, if we could go back to our earthly sinful nature, we're not going to be able to be restored. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But... And this is a big but. And you know what they say. I like big buts. In the Bible, that is. But. This is a word saying, there's hope. There's something more. Whoever loses their life for me, Jesus says. Again, it's your choice. Whoever loses. But this time, this word loses means something different to me. Have you ever lost something on purpose? I can't really honestly recall a time that I have, but I thought about it. If there was something I just didn't want, probably a bad memory or something that I just didn't want in my possession, whether it be materialistic possession or not, and I needed to get rid of it, would you lose it on purpose so that it wouldn't cause a stumbling block to your being a disciple of Jesus Christ? Have you lost it on purpose because you know what? It doesn't mean anything to you. Some of us would put it into a, a container and we put it up in our attic, not because we think we might need it again, but because we don't have a purpose. Matter of fact, our plan is to get rid of it at a, at a Goodwill store or to sell it in a garage sale. We realize that we don't need it because there's something greater. There's someone greater in store for us. To lose their life here refers again to the things of this physical world, your own desires, your own passions. If you're willing to lose your own desires, if you're willing to set aside your plan and your will for the greater things of eternity and live for me, again, for Jesus, says then you will find it. You'll find life. The word will, again, is another guarantee. If you lose it for his sake, you will, no doubt, really gain eternity. You will receive something. It says you will find, even without looking. Isn't that strange how God works? Our desires become his desires. And then he gives back to us tenfold. He says you will find it. You will find life. Ah, but not the earthly life that we have. Not this life that's full of pain and illnesses, and viruses, and sicknesses, and sadness, but you will find life, eternal life, something much greater than you could ever imagine here. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for Jesus will find it. And then there's verse 26. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? I don't know if this was meant in Jesus' time as a rhetorical question, if it's a theological question, or if it's just a good question for all of us to contemplate. But it is a question that we all must ask ourselves at one point or another. What good will it be to gain the whole world? 
This word gain means to take into possession. What good would it be for you or for me to take everything into possession here in this world, such as the power, having power to be in control, or to have materialistic things like who has the most toilet paper or hand sanitizer, or property, or who has the greatest position in life? Well, that's good here, isn't it? Sometimes we feel good about ourselves because we have temporary joy in who we are or what we've accomplished or what we've earned. But Jesus asked, what good will it be if you have all those things yet? Yet meaning that if you do the former, if you have all those things, then he says, the latter will happen. What's the latter? What good is it for you to have the whole world yet lose your soul? To forfeit your soul is what the NIV says. This is a loss. Forfeit means losing something as a result of a rule or a non-observance of a law or a rule. The rule is, being here, that if you gain the whole world, if you work so hard to gain the things of this world, then the result will be you lose your soul. This word soul could be a whole sermon in and of itself. In fact, as I was studying it, um, and trying to, get to, to narrow it down to just a, a, some practical advice here this morning. I learned that it, could be, um, it can be mentioned 755 different times in just the Old Testament. And among those 755 times, there are 42 different English translations of the word soul. There are 428 times where it just says the word soul. And then 117 times it's kind of trans, transferred into this, um, or translated into this word of life. Throughout the New Testament, um, it frequently is designated to use as an understanding of this word life, as we understand it. So he's saying, what good is it if you have everything, but you lose your life? Like I said jokingly a little bit earlier about that slogan my one cousin and I shared, he who has the most toys still dies type of a mentality. Well, I can't take it with me. So what good is it if I gain this whole world, but I don't have life? I don't have the most important thing, the most important treasure that every Christian should have. And that's Jesus. The most important treasure that anyone in this world could ever receive is the hope of eternal life. And then he continues, he says, or another way to, to ask this question for Jesus to his disciples is, what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? What can you give in exchange for your life? Is there anything? It's an important question that you have to ask yourself. It's an important question that each one must ask. Is, is our soul that important? I believe it is. Our soul, our life, is the greatest gift that we can possess here on earth. But that life doesn't belong to us. It belongs to God. One person wrote that one soul is worth more than the entire world. How true. That's why the, the, um, the gospels share the story of um, the shepherd who would leave his flock to go find the one lost sheep. Or the, the one lady who would search the whole house to find the one coin. Those who are lost, it's our responsibility to find. Because their souls, their eternal life, is the most important thing. So we begin by, by asking ourselves, what does it mean to be a disciple? Jesus' own words taught us, to be a disciple means that we must uh, take up our cross we must first deny ourselves, and then we must follow him. And if we're so fortunate to be able to, to say, God, you can have all that I am. I'm going to sacrifice it all to you. I'm going to take up my cross. I'm going to, to put those things to death that are not important. And my mind's going to be on you and your things above. If we're so fortunate to be able to do that, then we can have eternal life. But I know, because I've talked to many. It, 
you know, you, you see people all around us in this world. That there are many, there, there are many people who are Christians, that call themselves Christians, that are in our church pews each week. That say, hey, I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm a disciple of Jesus. And while I'm not here to, to judge them, that's between them and God. Because I don't really truly know their heart. I don't know all of their situations in life. But I have to wonder, I have to ask myself, because if I were in the same shoes, I'd have to ask myself this question. Are the things of this world more important than eternal life? If I'm truly a disciple of Jesus, don't I want to not only deny myself and follow Christ and to, and to take up my cross, but don't I want to follow him? Don't I want to take that third step in being a disciple? And I don't believe for one moment that Jesus would be doing the things that we Christians claim that he would be doing on a Sunday morning or on the Sabbath. In fact, if we understand his, the Jewish law, if we understand the, the way that they live now even today, they revered, they observed the Sabbath day. We experienced it a few months ago when we were in, in Israel again. We noticed Sabbath day, they shut down. It's all about, about their faith. But man, our Sabbath days haven't become that way. If we're following Jesus, I don't think Jesus is going to be walking out to, to the store on a Sunday morning before he goes to the temple and offer his praise to God. Could be wrong. I don't believe Jesus is going to stay at home and work in his garden before he goes to the temple to praise God and to offer his, his, his praises. I don't think that Jesus is going to rush out to the Chicago Bears football game at noon because that's more important than going to church first. Now again, I understand you don't have to go to church at a certain time on Sunday morning. But don't justify your actions by saying, but, you know, I can worship God in the car. I can worship God in the garden. Yes, you can. But following Jesus is not, those are not the places he would go first. Yes, he would go to those places. And when he's there, he would worship. But those weren't his priority. So are we really following him? Or are we following the ways of this world? See, the world says, it's okay to call yourself a Christian. Call yourself a disciple and still go do your shopping on Sunday morning or still live your life the way you want on Sunday morning. He'll understand. He'll understand that you're busy, that you only have that time to get things done because you're busy working the rest of the week or you have other commitments. Maybe he would understand. I pray that he does, but my understanding of scripture is that you must go and follow doesn't mean you have to go be a missionary or you have to come and study to be a seminarian. But if we can't even put an hour or two ahead of our own priorities, our own selfish desires of life, how can we really believe sincerely that we are true followers, true disciples? Or maybe not, maybe I don't even say true disciples because I believe your heart is to, to love God. But are you really following Jesus the way he wants you to? Are you putting aside those things first? Again, this isn't to, to judge, but this is to encourage you. For the last thing that I want to hear from Jesus in my personal life is, get behind me, Satan. Your things are on the things of this world, Pastor Kyle. You're more worried about the NCAA tournament or you're more worried about getting your shopping done first or you're more concerned about doing this before you are the things that are really of matter. Life. Is there anything more valuable? Is there anything more important than eternal life? I don't believe so. Let us pray. God, forgive us when we claim to be disciples, but sometimes we don't even know what your teachings are. Forgive us when we claim to be disciples, but we don't understand what true sacrifice is. Forgive us when we claim to be your disciples, but we, we carry the things of our past, our sinful nature, either behind us in suitcases or upon our shoulders where we still think we can live the ways that we used to and follow you. 
That makes the burden even tougher. Oh, but God spur us on to be disciples that put to death the things of this world. May we, especially in these times, realize that these things are not important. Oh, what a struggle it is. What a struggle it is to to have our lives turned upside down. To not be able to go to our workplaces or to our schools or to our sporting practices and events. To be able to go to stores freely at times that we want or to do whatever it is that we want. Even to meet here in your presence within the confines of these walls. That's a sacrifice, God. But may it be a choice. May we at some point in our lives say, hey, even if I had to give up all those things when they're available, I would do so for the sake of following Jesus. Yes, God, it would hurt. It'd be tough. I'd be worried about what others might say about me. But oh, it'd be worth it. For there's nothing that I can have, no toy I can I can earn, no amount of money that I can save, no possession that I can get, no position at work that I can earn, no amount of power I can grab on this earth, nothing that is more valuable than life, eternal life, that is given through Jesus Christ. God, thank you for the opportunity to live a life that can follow you. Remind us each day to make it our choice, to make it our priority to be disciples. Amen. Okay. Now, may the love of Jesus Christ be with you. May his peace surround you and dwell richly within you. And may you continue to strive to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, to go and to be a part of of his ministry, so that when we are able to join together again in person, or when we're able to get out among our neighbors and our communities, that we can go and serve God the way he wants us to. 
May your day and your week be full of blessings. And again, if you need anything, please don't hesitate to contact me. My email is Pastor Kyle Timmons, all one word, all lowercase, Pastor Kyle Timmons at live.com. Or you can call the church office at 815 465 6191. Thank you and, and have a great day.